organizers for the invitation to speak. And uh, I'm very privileged to give something that's out of the ordinary. My, my talk is um, not this, uh, about the cutting edge research that you've been hearing about all day today. I was asked to sort of give a perspective on what it's like to have spent over four decades as a biochemistry uh, professor. And just to tell you what's ahead of you and your peers. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jim Dahlberg. I'm currently a, a uh, emeritus professor in biomolecular chemistry and associate director of the Morgan Institute. Um, did a postdoc in Cambridge, England uh, in the late 60s, and then uh, joined the faculty here uh, in 1969, which was definitely a couple of decades before the great majority of you were born. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to be talking about is um, a number of uh, uh, careers that I've had along the, uh, the pathway here. Um, let me start off by saying the time that I spent in Cambridge uh, uh, in Fred Sanger's lab as uh, a postdoc in, in his lab, uh, that was really a, a great highlight uh, in my life. Uh, Fred gave me a lot of insights on in how to uh, not only to be a scientist, but to be a, a decent person. At least he's a decent person. I'm trying to be. <laughs> um, so the... Um, Many of the, the technology uh, techniques that I'm going to be talking about, we're going to seem really antique to you folks because you've been hearing the, the cutting edge stuff. And back when I was a postdoc and uh, joined the faculty here, uh, we just didn't have that stuff. PCR had to wait another 20 years to be invented. Uh, gene chips, likewise, maybe 25 years, 30 years, and so forth. And so. Uh, there will be some uh, kind of uh, comic relief thing in terms of what I'm talking about. Over the years, I've had, uh, worn many hats um, teaching at the university, uh, doing research. I uh, co founded a couple of biotech companies. Um, I was an expert witness in a couple of litigation trials. Uh, I was a science advisor to the governor, Doyle, um, and uh, most recently, I served as the interim. CEO of the Mortgage Institute. Now, I'm not, not going to talk about all these things. I'm going to emphasize three of, the, of these uh, events, and I'll come back to each one individually. In terms of, oops, in terms of teaching, uh, the university, I taught, uh, spent my time about half, half time teaching medical students and half undergrads. Of course, I had graduate students and postdocs in the lab. Uh, what I want to emphasize today is uh, the research that went on in my lab uh, during that period. I've always had a very small uh, research group, uh, five to eight people max. And, uh, but having been here for uh, 40 years or so, that translates into quite a few people. So I'm not going to have time to uh, name everybody who was involved in all these events. And just take it from me right now. I didn't do it all, so I'm not taking credit for that. Uh, my research is always focused on nucleic acids. Uh, they, these are some fairly old pictures that we pulled out of the filing cabinet here. Uh, that's Fred Blattner. This is shortly after I came here. Fred, uh, Vasov Shabalsky, and uh, me with a more hair and a different color. Uh, and actually, I'm wearing a tie, which I... I was looking for that tie, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with these two guys, um, we did we uh, worked on bacteriophage lambda initial um, sequences of, of the messenger RNAs uh, that were made in vitro, uh, and then analyzed um, following a, a method that I had worked on uh, as a postdoc. Uh, we also studied quite a bit on, on the mechanism of uh, transcription. Collaborated with other, uh, several other uh, groups here on campus, Bernie, Masiasu, and Julian, um, on, mainly on ribosomal RNAs, and with Gobin and, and Dick Burgess on transcription, and then most recently with Mike Sheets, who's um, here, and he's a biomolecular chemistry professor working in uh, 
on Zephyrus uh, transcription. In the early days, we uh, developed some uh, methods for uh, looking at um, RNAs. This is a two-dimensional gel separation of, of small RNAs, in this case of E. coli. It works with lots of different organisms as well. Uh, you can, each one of those spots represents an individual RNA molecule, which at, the, at that time was quite an unusual thing to be able to study. And uh, we could analyze each one of those uh, RNAs by the fingerprinting methods that Fred Sanger had developed and uh, characterize uh, what these molecules were. Using those methods and others related to it, we, over the years, about, this didn't all happen in, in a week or anything, it took a couple of decades, uh, we worked on uh, the fat phage lambdas, I told you. Uh, we showed that uh, the primers for DNA synthesis for reverse transcriptases are uh, cellular tRNAs that are taken up by the virion uh, during infection. We studied small RNAs of E. coli, as shown here. We looked at this uh, 35 mass of 16S RNA, and amazingly, this was kind of revolutionary at the time because there were a lot of people at that time in the early 70s who actually thought that the function of ribosomal RNA was to hang proteins on them. And um, little did they know about ribozymes, of course, or the fact that um, that's the business, a big part of the, the business of, of ribosomes. And we showed uh, with Julian uh, that the 3 prime end uh, of 16S RNA is, is essential. Um, we've also looked, uh, found that uh, RNAs are encoded in ribosomal RNA genes and uh, studied quite a bit of uh, uh, the, on the synthesis of small nuclear RNAs as well, the transport. We had visitors to the lab. Uh, this, John, uh, Joan Stice and John Nagleton were postdocs in Cambridge at the same time I was, and they just happened to be passing through Madison, and, and uh, so got a Polaroid picture of them. Uh, also, Fred Sanger came in. Uh, he came for about a week. He wanted to switch uh, positions with me. I had gone to his lab to learn the fingerprinting and analysis of RNAs, and he wanted to learn a few techniques that I worked out here in Madison. And that was a lot of fun, too. Uh, needless to say, we had lab parties. And uh, this is my group at, uh, at the time. In 1974, we were studying, celebrating the identification of uh, another primer tRNA for MMTB, I think it was. And uh, at that time, you can see that uh, the uh, regulations for protocols uh, for behavior in the lab uh, <laughs> a lot more, a lot uh, less stringent than today. I mean, there's, of course, the champagne and the triscuits and that sort of thing. <laughs> However, uh, you can see the ice buckets for the champagne bottles as well as the radiation. <laughs> <laughs> um, another visitor to the lab, uh, and we had another lab party, is my brother. Uh, my brother Al is a professor at Brown University in biochemistry, and uh, he came to work and did some experiments with the ribosomal RNAs. And uh, this was the celebratory, uh, 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 the celebration of our research. And here I'm doing my best to look like a cool surfer, and my brother is doing his best not to look like a cool surfer. <laughs> Later on, uh, we uh, decided uh, our intentions turned much more to, towards cell biology. And we wanted to uh, relate the RNAs uh, to a more biological system. And uh, for that, we focused on Xenopus latus. Um, you, you can inject RNAs or DNAs into nuclei, or in some cases, okay, cytoplasm and, and of these oocytes and, and embryos and study what happens. And uh, using this methodology, we uh, learned about the mechanism of transport of RNAs between the nucleus and cytoplasm. We showed that some uh, are amino, uh, tRNAs can be amino isolated in the nucleus. Um, not that they have to, have to be every time, of course, but, but at, at times. Uh, we also studied the control of microRNAs uh, more recently. Uh, in the biogenesis in homocytes and embryos. And uh, very recently, in collaboration with Mike Sheets, we studied uh, the uh, 
RNA eye in the oocytes and embryos and discovered that the oocytes and embryos of Xenopus cannot carry out RNA eye. And then uh, we trace this down to the lack of, of a protein that's essential, AGO2, which has the nucleus activity in RNA eye. We've, uh, this is all RNA kind of experiments. We've also studied uh, some DNAs, um, both in terms of gene structure, uh, promoter mapping, and that sort of thing. And when we were studying the small nuclear RNA genes, uh, we discovered that there was an interesting structure in uh, some of the snRNA genes uh, that's a polypyrimidine tra uh, track repeat, CT, 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 and one strand AG on the other. And this what makes this uh, region unusual is that it can form a triple-stranded DNA under um, superhelical conditions, negative superhelicity. And uh, it, at low pH, and the region that low pH is required is you have to protonate the C's. But the consequence is that you can form this uh, triple strand here uh, with a single strand looping out. And this is what the topology looks like in a model of uh, the triple uh, polychromatides is um, going back on the helix. I have no idea whether this is actually biological function, uh, has a bio biological function, but it sure was fun to work out the topology. Now, uh, at about that time, uh, PCR was coming on the scene. We wanted to do a lot of PCR uh, amplifications of DNAs for various reasons. And we found that some DNAs just did not amplify well with PCR. And um, uh, we trace this down to the fact that uh, highly folded DNAs are the ones that gave us the most trouble uh, with PCR. Um, and the question is, what, what is it about a highly folded DNA or DNA can form the new back on itself? And I got a clue to this because uh, David Gelfand at, um, in California had, had come up with the same observation uh, that certain DNAs uh, could be amplified well, but uh, this is using the tax race. But if he, David had a, 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 vari a variation of the tax race that lacks the 5 prime exonuclease domain. And so we thought that maybe the exo was really responsible. And uh, this, this is, shows that, in fact, that is the case. Um, if you have a, a hairpin or just a folded DNA molecule, uh, the, here's a perfect duplex up here, uh, but they're single strands down here because they're just not complementary. It's just at the end of the bifurcation. Uh, during PCR, you would be elongating a, a primer going down this way. And uh, so that's what we've shown here. This primer goes down here and uh, pushes the, the end up to the bifurcation here. And it turns out that this is actually the substrate for the nuclease of tac polymerase. And it's been called a 5 prime exonuclease, uh, but in fact it's an endonuclease. And the endonuclease, uh, in this case, uh, cut specifically right at this point here. So what we have, have uh, observed is that it's a nuclease that recognizes a structure. And the structure is a flat, the 5 prime unpaired region that, uh, extended into a duplex, as well as the, another duplex on the other side of the other arm of the, of the bifurcation. Okay. When we did this experiment, we didn't know just where the end of that primer ended, uh, because this was, we were carrying this reaction out uh, with tac polymerase, the intact tac polymerase, and we didn't know just where the polymerase had stopped here. Uh, we now know that uh, for this to work, uh, the three front the three front end of this so-called primer strand has to overlap by one nucleotide, at least, of uh, this, this downstream uh, duplex. And so we, we say that that's invading this duplex. It's not really invading, it's just overlapping. We don't know that there's an actual uh, displacement. When we saw that, we realized that, in fact, what we're looking at is a structure-specific nuclease that sees this kind of structure, and it doesn't care what sequence there is. And so that, uh, a sort of an aha moment for us because it uh, meant that if we could synthesize biochemically or chemically synthesize any of these three components, we could reform the uh, substrate for the nuclease. 
and uh, that in fact is the case. And so if we wanted to cut, for example, a molecule at a specific place, we just synthesize, order the, the, the appropriate oligonucleotides, put them all together, add the enzyme, and then we cut. And that works. Okay. So we were very excited about that, and this was our aha moment. And then we said, we can cut any sequence we want. Okay. Um, nowadays, it's what sheep would just synthesize the thing. That it's not that way uh, at the moment. So we had another celebration. Um, <laughs> this is, now we've moved out of the lab into, into the uh, offices. Uh, Victor Lianachev and Marianne Brau uh, are the key uh, people working on this. That's Elspeth Lund in the back over there, and that's me, of course. Mike Turns, a postdoc, and this guy, young looking guy there is uh, the next speaker um, who happened to have uh, a lab right next to mine. Uh, it's not that he was my graduate student or anything like that. He was married to Marianne. Still is. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a patent uh, that we filed on, on the nucleus activity. We also wanted to um, take advantage of uh, Victor's skills uh, to uh, generate an enzyme that did not have the polymerase activity, but was on the specific nuclease domain of TAC. Because it, um, what you have with TAC, the native TAC polymerase, is two different enzymes, the polymerize, polymerizing in the, in the nucleus. And we want to get rid of the polymerase, so we'd only be working with the nucleus. And so by mutations, we could do that, and that was fine. We applied for a patent uh, on that variation of TAC polymerase, and the, the title of the patent was something like a nuclease deficient DNA polymerase. And uh, needless to say, Worf did not want to patent that. But in fact, that was a terrifically good patent because that gave us the options to work on a, a single a purified domain without having to, uh, to worry about uh, the polymerase itself. So they turned the patent back to me, and I uh, turned it over to a company that I had uh, started to work with, uh, with Lloyd Smith, which is Third Wave Technology. It's a company here in Madison. Third Wave got its start. Um, using this technology, the 5' nuclease, um, it really started with a conversation I had with, with Lloyd Smith, a chemistry professor, um, uh, when we were sitting next to each other and going down to a meeting in New Mexico. Lloyd had a friend, Lance Ford, uh, Lloyd and Lance overlapped at Caltech, and Lance was more of a business person than a scientist, but he's uh, good in both areas, and he became the CEO of Third Wave. Uh, we founded the company, um, just with our own savings, as well as some angel investors, venture capital uh, investment, and then grants from the government, NIST and SBIRs, uh, and then um, in various uh, amounts from different people, of course. Um, we uh, took the company off campus to rented space, uh, so our world headquarters, of course, was like uh, half a lab and a small office, but it sounded good. Um, and um, to get started, we used uh, borrowed equipment, scavenged equipment. People were throwing things away. We did not have a great deal of money, of course. Um, and so we actually uh, licensed, uh, got the license for the, the, this uh, technology here. We got that license from Morph. Uh, by giving Morph some stock in our company. And that was the first time Morph had done that, and has worked uh, sort of like served as a model uh, since then, and it's worked out very well for both for them and for us. Mainly for us, because we didn't have any money. <laughs> um, once the company got started, uh, we changed the goal from the original sequence, uh, cleavage of the sequence uh, that had started uh, our observation. Uh, to using that cleavage as a way of detecting uh, sequence changes in DNA. And I'll explain what this means, how this works in a second. We call this technology the invader technology because, as I said before, you have to have a, uh, a primer that in, sort of invades or at least overlaps the end of the bifurcated. This is the bifurcated DNA, and you want an invasion. And so but the idea is to interrogate a sequence in a target. Okay, this is a target DNA of any 
uh, genomic DNA of any sort. So it could be RNA too. So we uh, take this target um, and synthesize two oligonucleotides, um, what we call the invader and the probe oligonucleotide. And these are both synthetic. Uh, they're designed to be complementary to the target, so you have to know the sequence of the target, but, or, or at least part of the sequence, and the probe will sit down at one end, and then the, the uh, invader oligonucleotide, these are only about 15 nucleotides long, uh, the invader sits down right next to it, and is positioned so that, such that the three prime end of this invader uh, would overlap with the end of the, of the duplex between the probe and the target. And what we're doing is we're really interrogating this single nucleotide, in this case it's a C, and if, the, if that C is anything, if this nucleotide is anything but a C, the G won't base pair with it, and then you won't get invasion, but it's just a, a juxtaposition of the, of the end of, of the molecule. And this overlap is required for cleavage. And so we can uh, carry out the reaction, uh, add the enzyme, and the enzyme if, it's, uh, if this is really a C, the enzyme will cleave the uh, flap off of this, this artificial flap, and uh, that will float off. Now we do this uh, reaction at the melting temperature of this duplex, and so this, uh, once cleavage has occurred, this duplex falls apart, and this uh, uh, oligonucleotide comes off, and uh, another oligonucleotide, uh, another proto can sit down and be used again. And so what we do is we can just saturate the, the system with lots of probes, and this happens over and over again, we get a lot of flat uh, fragments. So what does that mean? Well, if you get these flat fragments, it tells you something about that nucleotide right here. Okay? Now we have to be able to assay uh, find this flat, and we do that by, uh, at, that's just the same thing you saw, we do that by a second reaction in the same tube, actually, and this is just what we call uh, signal generation, uh, where we have a, another oligonucleotide that folds on itself and uh, has a, an open spot where the, the released flap can sit down and direct cleavage of the end of this oligonucleotide, this um, uh, fret oligonucleotide, and uh, the, rela the released flap will, will cause the cleavage of the, of the end of this thing. And at the end here, we have a, a fluorescein dye, which had been uh, quenched by a nearby quenching dye. And, uh, but if you cleave this off, then the fluorescein is released, and you get white. And so again, you can do this at the melting temperature of that uh, interaction between the, the flap and, and the, uh, the fret oligonucleotide, and get single multiplication. And what this does is, in, in the original flap uh, amplification, you get about 10, 10 to the fourth molecules per uh, target molecule. And then each one of those can be uh, used to generate about 10 to the third. And so you get a huge amplification signal. And it's very, very specific. And so this um, uh, works, and it, uh, we were very excited about it. Mm -hmm. um, the um, Characteristics are it's, it's accurate and sensitive, uh, very inexpensive, obviously. It's rapid and easy to run. Uh, procedure uh, uh, can be adapted to just about any sequence you want. Uh, detection of new nucleotide, uh, nucleotide changes, SNPs, or uh, mutations that you want to uh, see whether they exist. Um, it's been, we've used it to quantify gene copy number. Uh, we used it uh, in my, lab, my own lab here at the university to uh, quantify RNAs. We, this was one of the first uh, papers to show that a particular microRNA uh, level course, correlated with uh, severity of cancer, in this case, in human lymphomas. And it can also discriminate between various strains of viruses. And the, uh, um, we focused on HPV. HPV uh, has different strains that are very similar to each other. Some of them will cause cancer, others are very benign. Uh, there's just a few nucleotide changes, and so this kind of assay would be very useful. And it's, uh, it's a lot faster and cheaper than uh, doing sequencing. 
so this made us feel uh, top of the world. Uh, we had incorporated early on, uh, sold stock publicly in 2001, got to uh, have over 300 employees, but it was like a kid in a candy shop. We didn't know where to stop. And so we lacked focus, and we really were trying to do everything, and uh, our viability, actually, our, our cash flow was really going down fast. And so in 2005, we hired a suit. <laughs> uh, Kevin Conroy is a great guy. Uh, he came on as CEO. Uh, he fo focused the company on HPV assays, and uh, in uh, 2008, a uh, company in Boston, Logic, bought the company, all the stock of, of Third Wave. Um, so we were, uh, Kevin was our uh, rep, came to the rescue. What this tells us is that focus is important. It's crucial if you're going to start a company. And I, there's another factor in this too, though. And that is, I want to point out the dates here. Sale, the IPO was in 2001, and that was like a week before the dot-com bubble burst. Okay, so we just got in under the wire. <laughs> we were bought out by Whole Logic in 2008. That was about a month before the stock market crashed. So not only, not only is focus crucial, so is luck. <laughs> so with that in mind, uh, I'll give you a few uh, ideas here. Uh, you want to stay focused on your goals if you're starting a company. I, I didn't get into this, but uh, you do want to be very careful about conflict of interest, especially if you're working at the university. Uh, Mike Cox was very generous at this time early on, has uh, served on a, a conflict of interest co uh, committee that I set up. Uh, this was before there were all these forms that we had to fill out. We were sort of the first people that sort of brought up the, the, the problem, the, the potential problem of, of having a conflict. And so we overdid it. We had the associate dean of, of research of the medical school and the associate dean of research of the graduate school on this committee. So we, we really had the heavies in there, but uh, there was no conflict. There was no problem with it. Uh, another thing you want to do is keep everybody informed. Uh, your co-workers, the chair, the dean. I actually went out and talked to Thomas Shalala, who's at the time the chancellor, and discussed it with her, too, because I just wanted to make sure everybody knew what we were doing. Uh, you want to hire good people. The Marianne Victor was spectacular, and so were uh, several other people uh, from biomolecular chemistry. And then finally, you have to know to let other people, people take over, people who know what they're doing. And uh, with that in mind, uh, I thought it was time to ride off into the sunset. And um, this is uh, out in, in Montana. Uh, but even though uh, we had uh, I've cut back my participations a great deal, uh, I still had a small lab here at the university, and we uh, continue to work. Uh, Elspeth Lund, uh, and uh, a few other people in my lab. So I thought that was it, and then I said many hats, one last hat, and that is uh, the Marbridge Institute of Research. Um, Marbridge Institute is the private part of this uh, discovery building uh, down here on, on, on Johnson Street, University of Johnson, and um, I had been asked to join the board of directors of the, of the Mortgage Institute, and then in um, 2012, I was asked, last year, I was asked to uh, become the interim CEO when the uh, current CEO stepped down. Uh, they asked me because I was familiar with the Mortgage Institute. I knew how the university operates. I'm a scientist living in Madison and uh, had some time that uh, I could give up. Uh, so I, I agreed to do it. But the problem was, I had no experience as an administrator. Uh, but uh, I was able to uh, learn and uh, step up to the, the task. Uh, I changed the mission of the, the Morbridge Institute, so now it's much more focused on helping the university and cooperating, getting, promoting uh, collaboration with the university. And uh, the most important job that I had uh, was to find my replacement. And that is. Uh, <laughs> Brad Schwartz, who is the, the new CEO, and he's also a professor in biomolecular chemistry. It gives me time to go back uh, to my day job, which is the professor. Uh, so looking back, 
I'm pleased to have this great experience, a uh, wonderful uh, time in, in science. Uh, I've been able to stay, keep in close contact with uh, my uh, friends and colleagues, and uh, I've also been fortunate to work in uh, a field where they're actually paying me to do what I enjoy. I was also very lucky uh, to be coming into molecular biology when it was in its infancy, so there were a lot of weak questions to ask. Uh, very fortunate that Fred Sanger took me into his lab, and I've had wonderful uh, students, collaborators, and postdocs, uh, especially Elsa, uh, who's here. And I have uh, great support from the Department of Biomolecular Chemistry, and I want to thank them for their support, too. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dahlberg. 